it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Alex Sandy Pentland. Sandy, as we know him best, he directs the MIT Human Dynamics Laboratory and the MIT Media Lab Entrepreneurship Program. He co-leads the World Economic Forum on Big Data and Personal Data Initiatives. And he's a founding member of the advisory boards for Nissan, Motorola Mobility, Telefonica, and countless uh, startup firms. In fact, his entrepreneurship program at the Media Lab has spawned off 30 and counting startups. It's a really uh, excellent program. In 2012, Forbes named Sandy one of the seven most, most powerful data scientists in the world. In 2013, he won the McKinsey Award from uh, Harvard Business Review. He is by far one of the most cited computational scientists in the world. In the last few years, he's written two great books, um, Honest Signals of a Few Years Back, and in your gift packet today, you have Social Physics. Sandy? Thank you. Take it on. Good. So as Eric and Andy have made clear, one of the biggest challenges we're facing today is that technology innovation is outstripping cultural innovation, government innovation. In other words, we're like kids from the sort of 1700s being given, you know, Star Trek laser guns and occasionally accidents happen. Uh, and so one of the most pressing questions is, how can we make innovation accelerated? And one of the biggest tools is social networks. And I want to talk about that and show you some of the research we've been able to do and some of the suggestions that come from that that I think may surprise you but are also fundamentally sort of hopeful. Now, to understand this question of how social networks, how structures in companies can promote greater innovation, we have to understand more about ourselves. And for the last two centuries, the main way we understand ourselves is through the teachings of Adam Smith and his cohort. So we think of ourselves as individuals, as competing, as rational or maybe quasi-rational, uh, and that's the language that we use for almost everything. Government, companies, policies. But that's actually not a terribly good description. It's good 17th century uh, science, but it's not good 21st century science. Because we're also social animals. We live in social networks. And in particular, we learn from each other. And that, I think, is the place where we can begin to see where innovation comes from. We can't hope to just by ourselves think up all this stuff and make it happen. We have to learn from each other, try things out, spread things throughout the society in order to have an innovative society or an innovative company. Now, unfortunately, from a technology point of view, this has been really difficult. You'd have to have, what, PhD psychologists on every corner, you know, watching what people are doing to be able to get the data. But as Sinan was talking about, now we have social media, where we can do experiments with a quarter billion people. Uh, we have credit cards. So uh, recently, I've had uh, the six years of credit card data for 100 million Americans in my lab. Think about that for a second. Um, but also, cell phones are an enormous source of data, because they show where you go, who you call, things like that. So suddenly, the breadcrumbs that we leave behind and the things we post give us the information to be able to really learn about ourselves. And that's the revolution that I think is likely to save us. If we can really understand how to be innovative, how to work together, we can solve some of these employment crises. We can maybe even solve global warming. And so this big data, these breadcrumbs that we leave behind, are so detailed, so numerous, that we can actually write down equations, which I'm not going to pester you with. Don't worry. No, no exam at the end. But equations that begin to describe accurately how ideas move from person to person, how behaviors change in a way that's not only quantitative but predictive, and the basis on which we can develop new social structures. And this revolution is called social physics. The name was chosen over two centuries ago by the father of sociology. And he believed that ideas shaped culture and that there was a fixed progression of ideas that cultures would go through, which we know to be wrong today. Uh, but the idea that ideas are the thing that matters remains. And in fact, from my point of view, the key lesson 
in social physics is that the flow of ideas, so I have an idea, I act on it, you see it, you learn, you begin to act on it, the next person, the sort of influence that Sinema was talking about is the key to what you could call a collective intelligence. And in fact, we had a paper in science about this, talking about groups. We got hundreds of groups of regular people and brought them together and we looked at their patterns of interaction. And what we found is that these groups had a collective intelligence that was independent of the intelligence of the individual people. It was an emergent phenomenon. And it was of the same magnitude as things like IQ or the effect of your genome on your health behaviors. So it's a big thing. If you want to know what it looks like without sort of reading the scientific paper, which is of course a little dense, it has to do with is everybody contributing equally? And are there a lot of ideas being put on the table? So one person lecturing on and on, like I'm doing right now, not so good. If everybody isn't engaged and sort of harvesting ideas, not so good. But if you get those two things together, you get that buzz, we all know. We walk into a room, we see a group, and they're like on fire. And even if it's a different language, we can tell that they're on fire. And that's this collective intelligence. And this collective intelligence works in companies, too. So what I've done in the last several years is look at dozens of companies. And I produce something like this. This is a graph, an animation of idea flow in a company. It's a German bank. It's an advertising department, so it's a creative group. And the little boxes are things like management and development and sales. And the one at the end there is customer service. Each frame that gets up there is one day of worth of data. The blue stuff is the email and so forth. And the red stuff is something that you've never even imagined. We give everybody these little name badges to measure who talks to who. We don't look at the words. Just did they talk around the coffee pot? Did they talk in the hall? And that's what the flow of ideas looks like in this corporation. You can see groups talking to each other, things percolating around. And when you analyze this idea flow, you find the same sort of thing we saw in groups. So this is a graph of the face-to-face -face flow and, and, and interaction in this German bank. It turns out that the face-to-face -face stuff, though, is the only stuff that really mattered. All that email and stuff, I mean, that's, you know, without it, I'm sure it would have been tough. But it wasn't correlated with productivity or creative output. And we see that in company after company after company, whereas the pattern of face-to-face -face stuff is. So within a work group, we have something we call engagement, which is actually a mathematical formula. And if you have good engagement, then what you find is that group is more productive. And this is not a small effect. This is four or five times bigger than personality, for instance. It's often 30 or 40% of the variation between a poor group and a good group. Just is everybody on the loop? Does everybody talk to each other? It's not meetings. It's the little casual conversations on the side. And it's causal. For instance, we went into a call center, and we looked at this with these little badges. And I said, this is crazy. These guys aren't talking to each other. Of course they're not very productive. And I convinced them to change the coffee break structure, just so people could talk to each other more. Productivity soared. They saved $15 million a year just from changing the coffee break structure. There's another pattern here which is outside the red stuff called engagement, and that I call exploration. So that's the stuff you're not supposed to do. Your boss says, here's your org chart, you're supposed to talk to these guys. If you talk to other people, like the janitors and the sales guys and stuff, it turns out that that correlates very strongly with creative output, with innovation. It's bringing other perspectives in. Again, face-to-face -face stuff. So there have been studies, for instance, of Bell Labs showing that this is true, but not quantitative things because they couldn't measure it. And we've been able to do things in drug discovery units where its entire business depends on their creative output, right? And in advertising groups. And often 10 to 20 percent, sometimes even more, of the innovation output depends on this other pattern of connecting. The same things happen at scale. So we got data from 300 cities, half in the U, half in the US, 
And we use things like Foursquare to look at the pattern of face-to-face -face communication. And what we found was is that if you could tell me the density of the city and the transportation pattern, then I could tell you the pattern of face-to-face -face communication, the pattern of idea flow. And from that, I could tell you very precisely the GDP per square kilometer. I could tell you the patenting rate. I could tell you the crime rate. Just from that. So it's not education that I had to resort to. I wasn't talking about educational levels. It wasn't specialization. It wasn't government policies. It was just banging ideas together to create innovation that accounted for the GDP growth. And I say it's exponential because as you get more of this happening, the GDP does not go up linearly. It goes up exponentially. This is why big cities like New York have such a special vibe about them. So now we understand a little bit about innovation, maybe. And the question comes, why don't digital social networks do this? Right? All those people in those cities had digital social networks. All the people in the company had digital social networks. They didn't seem to contribute. Why not? Well, let's look at a specific example. So I have a partnership with a particular company that lets me see things that nobody else can see. It's a company called eToro, which is a financial trading platform. So people, mostly day traders, they're not professionals, are buying dollars and euros. They're shorting them. You can get leverage up to 400. Oh my god. Uh, they're doing stocks. They're gold, silver. There's 1.6 million of these people all around the world. Now it's up to 3 million, but at this point it was 1.6 million. And I can look at all of the social networks and all of the interactions because on this network you can see what everybody else is doing. It's open. I can see the trades you're doing. I can even follow you. If I think you're particularly hot, I can say, I'm going to take 10% of my money and put it on him. Whatever he does, I'm cool, right? I don't know how he does that, but he's going to make me some money. And I can analyze this social network in terms of idea flow. How fast do the ideas move around? And when I do that, and then I plot how much money did people make, the 1.6 million people during the whole day, millions of trades, I find this graph. As you get more idea flow, you go from isolated traders, which don't do very well at all, they're pretty much market neutral, to people that are doing quite well, thank you. And I can tell which days they're going to do well on and which days they won't by the pattern of the idea flow. And then a weird thing happens is, is that as the idea flow gets faster and faster, so the network gets more and more interconnected, you get these cascades of things, these echo chambers going on, which actually not very many different ideas. It's the same ideas again and again, and everybody, it's fads. It's financial bubbles. And of course, not only does the ROI go down, but you get popping bubbles sometimes. We have an interesting story about a guy from Latvia who was very hot for a while. He recruited tens of thousands of people to his little bubble, and then he made a mistake. And they all got wiped out. <laughs> so bubbles are not so good. But you notice that if we could somehow get rid of those echo chambers, we could be in a place that's truly the wisdom of the crowd. And the thing to remember is, is that correctly engineered idea flow leads to better decisions. And if you compound those, you get better and better performance. And that's the root of innovation. So why doesn't this happen in the real world? Well, in the real world, we have a lot of context to be able to tell when we're in an echo chamber. So when the guy, the taxi driver, gives you tips on stocks, you know you're in an echo chamber, right? When everybody in Tirar Square is chanting the same slogan, that's an echo chamber. We're pretty good at detecting these. Not perfect, but pretty good. But in a digital social network, it's very hard to tell. Are these two guys the same opinion, just of some third person? That's what happened with our Latvian. Everybody thought they were following lots of different people, but in fact, they were all following the same guy. So what can we do to bring more innovation into the system? Well, there are several things we can do. One is that we can have more experimentation. So in the last couple of years, I've been doing something that's perhaps a little weird, setting up living labs. Like I helped set up this one in Italy, city of Trento. 
now lives under different rules than the rest of Italy. And one of the different rules it has is about sharing information. So for the last six years, I've been helping to lead the privacy discussion at Davos, how do you deal with big data? And we've come up with a series of recommendations about how to make big data safe and how to increase the innovation in cities. And we've built software funded by DARPA and we've implemented it in Trento. And we have all these young families now using this to see if indeed it promotes more innovation and if indeed it's safe. Pretty interesting. Here's an even more interesting thing you can do. In digital social networks, you can cancel the echoes. Because if you can see the whole network, you can do all this fancy math, and it's very big math. It takes an Amazon Cloud Plus a little to do this. But you can see when people are in an echo chamber. And you see in that echo chamber, they tend to get a certain return on investment, and they're susceptible to financial bubbles. And what you can do is you can calculate which links in the social network you should break in order to destroy the echo chamber. It's not a trivial thing, but we did this with these 1.6 million people. We gave out coupons that said, you should pay attention to that guy over there. Okay? And what we were able to do is move it from the madness of the crowd to the wisdom of the crowd and double the return on investment for the 1.6 million people. That's pretty good. I will tell you that after three, four days, they went back to being stupid again. But <laughs> at least we started, okay? And so that's the type of thing that we're engaged with now. We're beginning to look at how we select strategies, how we learn from each other, and how we can amplify that to create better decisions and more innovation. How we can move from the madness of the crowd that we see all too often to true wisdom of the crowd. And the hope is that that's going to get us out of a lot of the problems that we find ourselves in today. So you all have a book in your bags. Goes into it in more detail. It's not for the uh, faint-hearted, but if you go through there, I think you might find some interesting things about privacy, about digital social networks, and about innovation. Thanks. So I have time for questions here. Sandy, in a previous panel, the question came up on managing personal information, a subject I know you've thought a hell of a lot about. So can you give your thoughts on that, how you think it should be done? So the, uh, the group that I've been helping to lead at Davos consists of senior regulators like the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, uh, Justice Commissioner of the EU, but also CEOs of major multinationals, you know, Vodafone, Microsoft, et cetera. And uh, that's really the question that we wanted to ask because it's clear that not only is there huge commercial value in this, but it's also this big data is going to be the thing that might save us in terms of government and government policy and that it's very dangerous. In fact, even we've had people from the Politburo in China join us because they're concerned about what their companies are doing to their citizens. And the, the question was, how can you think about this? And the answer is that you need to have people win, you need to have companies win, and you need to have governments win. You can't pick something where people lose, otherwise it's going to be almost impossible to implement. But there is a solution, and that really is to treat your digital identity the way you treat your physical identity. You're largely in control of your physical identity. You can decide to go, you can decide to reveal yourself, don't do it too much, the cops will take you away, things like that. But we don't have that power in our digital identities. Companies, governments take our data, we don't even know they're taking it, we don't know what they're doing with it. Now, in the physical world, we've spent some millennia <laughs> trying to develop rules about that, and that's where the democratic process and, and markets came into being. But we don't have that in the digital world. So what the solution that we came up with was to democratize the control of data. Fundamentally what that means is that you get much more control about data than it is about you. Um, and that companies have to ask for opt-in in very particular ways for particular functions, 
in order to use data about you. And that that has to be auditable. You can think about personal data as being like money in the bank. Today, you take the string of digits, that's your money, and you stick it in the bank, and then you can look and say, oh, string of digits is still there, right? There's no physical money. And the government will come along and audit it. So you can be pretty confident it's there, reduces fraud, and you can pull it out when you want to. And that's the type of thing that we have come to as a proposed solution for personal data. It sounds a little quixotic, but in fact, this is the core of the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights in this country. It's the core of the Data Protection Acts in the EU. We've built software that does this. It's not expensive. We've deployed it with people, real people. Right? We're turning MIT into this. This is a living lab where the students, the faculty, the workers control data about them. And you ask, well, why would corporations go along with it? Well, so that's the, the, the first part, is the data protection part. Corporations will go along with it because now, with your opt-in, if I inform you about what value you're going to get for it, I can ask for extremely personal data. So for instance, we're working with Mass General Hospital to reform the medical system because they would like to have behavior data. Behavior is probably the cause of 80% of all health problems, but the only way they can get it is in an interview, a subjective interview, in this clinical visit that you get maybe once every six months, and it's maybe six minutes. But if I could take data from your cell phone and your credit cards and things like that, and in a privacy-preserving, in a respectful way, in a way that you control, get at that data for your medical histories, then I could deliver truly personal medicine. So that's the deal. Governments have more access to data with opt-in, the citizens vote. Citizens get the ability to share data safely for value that they care about. And companies get a path to monetization if they engage the citizens. It's called the New Deal on Data. You can look it up. Another question? Hi, uh, my name is Bhavik. Yeah. How do you look at uh, social physics where influence on data is there? For example, in healthcare industry where doctors influence a lot of uh, decisions that individuals or patients take. So is there any dynamics that has been worked around the social physics part for the collaborative intelligence that can come into the healthcare industry? So um, one of the things that you learn with social physics is that this model of individuals that don't much interact with each other uh, misses the most important exchanges that are in our lives, which are exchanges with each other. Ideas, favors. In fact, Adam Smith said this in his book, Moral Sentiments. When you quantify this and you write down the equations in the way that economists do, but now including the peer-to-peer -peer effects, you discover that generically, that means almost always, it's more cost efficient to incent people using social ties rather than incent them individually. That's an enormously important and hard to understand thing. I'll give you an example. I took two, a community of young families, divided them two, I gave them cell phones, and on the cell phone they could see how active they were. And in Boston, you know, in the winter, it's easy to just get inactive and turn into a blob. So they could see how active they were, and I rewarded them with money if they were more active than they were previously normal financial incentive. And then in the other group, other half of the community, I assigned them buddies. And the buddies were the people that they interacted with most often. And if you were more active, your buddies made money. Not you, your buddies. And that was between four and eight times more effective. In other words, you got four to eight times the bang for your buck, and it was sticky. After I ran out of money, which happens quickly because I'm a university, people kept being more active. We used the same scheme in Switzerland. We took a canton, one of their states, that was trying to have an energy saving policy because uh, they had hydroelectric power up to a certain point, and then they had to go to diesel power, so they wanted to keep it into the hydroelectric range. And they tried economic incentives of all sorts. They tried education. Nothing was working. And I suggested that they sign up people with buddies. Pick your buddies, sign up. Everybody has to do this, right? 
And if you save energy, your buddies make a little bit of money. So with a budget of about 50% per week, we were able to obtain an energy savings of 17%. Now, in comparison, there have been experiments where people have done straight economic incentives to get that large of an effect. It involved doubling the price of the energy. So it's not, in this case, six to 48 times more effective. This is like almost two orders of magnitude more effective to use these social network incentives. Oh, okay.